The gospel for today is from the, the book of Matthew, chapter 5. This should be a very familiar passage. You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how can its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything, but is thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A city built on a hill cannot be hid. No one, after lighting a lamp, puts it under the bushel basket, but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. We hear many times in scripture that Christ is living water. And that that is what he offers us in offering us himself. But in these words from Matthew, he talks about salt, not about water. When we say someone is the salt of the earth, what is it exactly that we mean? We're saying usually that an individual is practical, down to earth, hardworking, a person of integrity and honesty, reliability, a person that you can count on. But that is only part of what Jesus means in the gospel lesson for today. And in order to grasp his full meaning, we must look more closely at his metaphor. You knew that was coming, didn't you? <laughs> Try to describe this taste of salt and try to do it without using the word salty. It's pretty hard to do. Salt is, well, salt is salt. Salt adds zest to food. It enhances flavor. It makes something bland more appealing. So, Jesus says, imagine this. You reach for the salt shaker, sprinkle salt on your food, taste it, and to your amazement, you notice that the salt isn't salty. What good is it? That's its only function, to be salty. And if salt isn't salty, well, it isn't salt. You are the salt of the earth, Jesus says. And as salt, your role, your responsibility is to add zest to life, to en enhance the flavor of living, to make what could be bland more interesting. This actually sounds like fun. <laughs> then he goes on to say, you are the light of the world. Remember that throughout this passage, Jesus is speaking to his disciples, and he is training them to teach and to preach and to spread the good news to the far corners of the earth. And he tells them that if they hide their light, it will go out. By inference here, their salt will lose its saltiness. Jesus' own salty, enlightening behavior is well known. A few examples come to mind. At age 12, he seemed so incredulous that his parents worry after they had searched for him for three days. Why were you searching for him, me, he asked. Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? Later, at the wedding at Cana, he speaks to his mother who comes to him with the problems about the host running out of wine. Woman, what, is that, what concern is that to you and me? My hour has not yet come. And then he goes on and he does what his mother asks anyway. <laughs> at another point, he seems intent on thinning the crowds traveling with him. He astounds us when he says that we cannot be his disciples unless we hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, and yes, even life itself. Later, when Peter rebukes Christ for saying that he will be killed, Christ turns to him and says, Satan, get behind me. You are a stumbling block to me, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. And there are many more examples of salty behavior. Behavior, however, that also enlightens. In the 16th century, Martin Luther felt that part of the preacher's duty was to open his mouth, to speak out candidly, 
Luther said the preacher should not hold a leaf in front of his mouth. In other words, the preacher should speak up fearlessly. My husband's father was a Lutheran pastor for 55 years before his death in 1990. He was a preacher after Luther's own heart. In fact, he even looked like Luther. <laughs> and he seemed to have a similar disposition. His manner was salty. He was direct. Did he offend people? Occasionally. Was he also one of the most loving people I have ever known? Yes, absolutely. Was this an unsettling combination? You better believe it. I remember a time when a wealthy member of his congregation, a person who lived quite lavishly with fancy cars, a huge home, multiple servants, frequent vacations in Paris and Monaco, dropped a check for $1,000 in the offering plate at a midnight Christmas Eve service. Now this family had not given anything else all year long. And this is what they usually did. Compared with the faithful weekly offerings of people of much more modest means, this $1,000 looked flashy but had no substance behind it. On Christmas Day, Dad asked if he could pay a visit to this man's home. And clearly expecting a visit in which his generosity would be praised, the man said, sure, Pastor, come on by. We'll expect you for a little Christmas sherry this afternoon. That afternoon, my father-in-law met with his family, drank a glass of sherry, and returned the check, saying, I'm neither interested nor impressed with this donation right before the end of the tax year. I am impressed by the retiree living on a fixed and very inadequate income, or the seminary student of limited means whose sacrificial and incremental giving by the end of the year makes your $1,000 look pretty paltry. Furthermore, he said, these people of modest means would be embarrassed to receive my thanks. Now, I imagine that that family thought that Pastor Baumgartner had a lot of nerve to say and do what he did that day. But he was showing true saltiness, and he was enlightening. And believe it or not, they came back. <laughs> In the 16th century, Martin Luther was bothered by the fact that there were divisions in Christendom and that while he was standing up for what he believed was the truth, he was also being viewed as the chief perpetrator of these divisions. He said this, I have for years labored with all diligence at this knotty problem and have considered how I could so preach about the Lord Christ that everybody would be pleased and that no one would be offended at him, but it cannot be done. He went on to say, I am faithful and seek peace. Where are these disturbances and this war coming from? From me, indeed, but without my fault. For if I were quiet and permitted these disturbers to say and to do everything as they pleased, then peace would remain. But how can we remain silent, he continued, about what we have seen, about what we have heard, nay, about what we have been commanded to proclaim, not in closed rooms, but from the housetops? For so says Christ, go ye and preach the gospel to every creature, and again, no one hides a light under a bushel. Luther said that the word of God was like a live coal put into your mouth. We can't just keep it there. If we have live coals in our mouths, we are forced to open our mouths. Then he said, the fight begins. He says, you see, people abolish the command of God, and then they want me to be silent. Fortunately for Christendom, Luther and other reformers were not silent. But now in these times, how can we speak the truth so that it is heard? How can we be living salt, standing up for what is right, not backing down, but at the same time avoiding narrow self-righteousness? How can we also enlighten? 
We live at a time and in a country where people are not afraid to be mean-spirited, to make offensive statements not out of love, but with great self-righteousness, with no compassion. I have had my eyes open by Facebook, especially the entries of my nieces and nephews. What I see and read there on entries they freely make offends and disturbs me. It's not just the profanity, it's the self-righteous tone. And there are also conversations that take place among students and Wheaton and, believe it or not, even occasionally among faculty, that also have this harshness, this judgment, and once again, an offensive tone that sometimes permeates impassioned argument. Argument that too often leads to invective and insult. Is this the salt Jesus was speaking of? This is salt, but this is not true saltiness because think of it, salt adds bite, but the other property of salt is that it preserves food. It does not destroy it. So the mean-spiritedness that one observes in every public forum, from the halls of Congress to church council meetings, this meanness is so different from what Christ meant when he said, you are the salt of the earth. Being the salt of the earth does not mean destroying the human spirit, lacking compassion, and lashing out selfishly to hurt others and to see one's own way prevail. Being the salt of the earth means letting your light so shine before others that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Being the salt of the earth means being a faithful servant. Being the salt of the earth means speaking with the courage that your faith gives you. Being the salt of the earth means living the kind of life that gives glory to God. Okay, that works, you say. But what happens when you speak with courage and with faith, faithfulness and no one listens? I think of Jeremiah here. <laughs> what about those individuals who have not spoken to us as Republicans or Democrats or has, as members of the right or members of the left? What about those people who have spoken to us more as a prophet would speak? How do we and how should we handle such saltiness? Do you know about Alexander Solzhenitsyn? He was a Russian writer who told the truth about what was going on behind the Iron Curtain while he lived behind the Iron Curtain, whose writings had to be smuggled out of Russia, who won the Nobel Prize for his work, and who was finally forced into exile because it would been, have been too much of an embarrassment for the communist regime to exterminate him because he was such a public figure. He lived in Vermont for a while, was something of a hermit, didn't make many public appearances, except for once when he gave a commencement address at Harvard University. And his words were not what those gathered wanted to hear because his words criticized our life in the West. He couldn't believe the, wa the waste generated by our throw-it-away culture. He couldn't believe the state of our literature and our music. He couldn't believe that we, as a people, could have ignored for so long the plight of people in other countries, people who were suffering or standing up for what we seem to hold so casually, this freedom of ours. Your freedom, he said to us, has not led you to be more moral, more compassionate. Your freedom, he said to us, has led you to be more selfish. Alexander Solzhenitsyn's words, like Luther's during the 16th century, did not please his listeners. In fact, his words were met with indignation and anger. What right did this immigrant, some people said, this intruder who is accepting our kindnesses and hospitality, what right did he have to say such terrible things about us? On one level, 
This reminds me of my father-in-law returning the check. I am sure that the response of the man to whom he returned it was, how dare he not accept our generosity, but criticize our motives. I am reminded of a scene in one of my favorite novels. You knew this was coming. <laughs> it's not a poem this time. It occurs in New Orleans in a jazz club. And the man speaking the words has something to say about Christ, which sounds at first hearing pretty offensive, but which really is the truth. I feel particularly blessed as an English professor because in my world of story and poetry, there is plenty of living salt. Many authors are speaking the truth and they speak it so that it can be heard. Their salt has not lost its saltiness, nor are they putting their light under a bushel. Their fiction has bite, however, and it may provide shocks for the meek-minded. But as one of these authors, Flannery O'Connor, says, for the hard of hearing you shout, for the blind you draw large and startling figures. This is exactly what Michael Malone does in his novel, Handling Sin. In this novel, the main character, Raleigh Whittier Hayes, an insurance salesman from North Carolina, is rattled out of his normal routine and into the grace of God. A successful and affluent family man, Raleigh discovers one day that his critically ill father, an unsuccessful minister in a local church, has checked himself out of the hospital where he has been treated, withdrawn all his money from the bank, and disappeared leaving behind a list of tasks for Raleigh to perform if he is to receive his considerable in inheritance. Raleigh has been to church all his life, but he is actually not a true believer at all. He is a skeptic. And this began at eight years old, the day of his confirmation, when he had made a deal with God. If God would grant him superhuman strength for just a second, Raleigh would believe in him. He wrapped a rope around his waist and tied the other end to the bumper of his uncle's new car. Chanting the Lord's Prayer and Christ's two commandments, he pulled and strained, but the car didn't budge an inch. But then, and I quote now from the book, all right, warned Raleigh <clears throat> and gave God a final third chance. He started to sing the creed he had struggled so proudly to memorize. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. He felt something, a tiny lessening of the tension in the rope. Heaven and earth, heaven and earth. Frantically, he tried to remember what came next in the creed, then skipped rushing ahead, guessing at words he didn't know. And of all things, visional and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, forgotten, not made, <laughs> being of one supper with the Father by whom all things were made. He felt it again, the slack in the rope. He could take a step, another step. The car was moving. Raleigh strained until his neck ached and blood ran from the corner of his lip. He had pulled the car 10 feet forward when he heard the hideous sound, the laughter of his cousins as they yelled, it's Uncle Hackney. And Raleigh turned to see his uncle rise from the rear of the car where he had been pushing, helping Raleigh and God along. <laughs> Yelling, I don't need any help, Raleigh establishes then and there his identity as the cynical agnostic he was to remain for the next 37 years. 37 years ago, later, he arrives in New Orleans and he meets up with his father, finally, in a jazz club. It is coincidentally Holy Week. In fact, Thursday of Holy Week, Monday Thursday, when Christ's celebration of the Lord's Supper is observed, Remember now, Raleigh's father is dying. In the early hours, morning hours of the next day, Good Friday, Raleigh's father asks him what the date is. April 1st, said Raleigh. It is, his father says, April Fools? 
Well, I'll be damned. Now there's a Jesus joke for you. What I meant was, it's Good Friday. Now that's funny, Raleigh. Old Jesus is hanging there. They're jabbing swords in him and shoving vinegar at him, and he flops over dead. Then he wink, winks open one eye, see, and says, April Fools. <laughs> ha ha, said Raleigh. If you went around in your church saying things like that, it's no wonder they fired you. You know, a lot of people don't find the crucifixion a comic matter. Well, his father said, the joke's on them. What his father realizes is that for a very long day on Good Friday, the day of Jesus' crucifixion, the story looks like the darkest tragedy, but it is not. It is the opposite of tragedy. For the hard of hearing you shout, for the blind you draw large and startling figures. In the final lines of the novel, at his father's funeral service on Easter Monday, with the promise of the resurrection now fully realized, Raleigh himself begins to understand what the resurrection means. No, he can't do it all by himself. He will always need help. And yes, God has endowed him with superhuman strength, so long as he depends on the strength of others. His father's living salt has not only had bite, it has preserved Raleigh, it has saved him. The bite of salt, that which gives our lives zest and flavor, is the realization that the unimaginable has occurred, that what appears to be death is really life, that what appears to be a tragedy on the cross is really the happiest story of all. So we are to keep our lights in the open we are to love courageously. We are to be, as Christ himself instructed, living salt. <laughs>